Chapter Seven of Sailing Alone Around the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Chant. Sailing Alone Around the World by Joshua Slocum. Chapter Seven, consisting of weighing anchor at Buenos Aires. An outburst of emotion at the mouth of the plate, submerged by a great wave, a stormy entrance to the strait, Captain Samblick's happy gift of a bag of carpet tacks, off Cape Froward, chased by Indians from Fortescue Bay, a miss shot for Black Pedro, taking in supplies of wood and water at Three Island Cove. Animal life. On January twenty sixth, eighteen ninety six, the spray being refitted and well provisioned in every way, sailed from Buenos Aires. There was little wind at the start, the surface of the great river was like a silver disk, and I was glad for a tow from a harbour tug to clear the port entrance. But a gale came up soon after and caused an ugly sea and instead of being all silver as before, the river was now all mud. The plate is a treacherous place for storms. One sailing there should always be on the alert for squalls. I cast anchor before dark in the best lee I could find near the land, but was tossed miserably all night, heart-sore of choppy seas. On the following morning I got the sloop under way, and with reefed sails worked her down the river against a headwind. Standing in that night to the place where Pilot Howard joined me for the up-river sail, I took a departure, shaping my course to clear Point Indio on the one hand, and the English bank on the other. I had not for many years been south of these regions. I will not say that I expected all fine sailing on the course for Cape Horn direct, but while I worked at the sails and rigging, I thought only of onward and forward. It was when I anchored in the lonely places that a feeling of awe crept over me. At the last anchorage on the monotonous and muddy river, weak as it may seem, I gave way to my feelings. I resolved then that I would anchor no more north of the Strait of Magellan. On the 28th of January the spray was clear of Point Indio, English Bank, and all the other dangers of the River Plate. With a fair wind she then bore away for the Strait of Magellan, under all sail, pressing farther and farther towards the wonderland of the south, till I forgot the blessings of our milder north. My ship passed in safety Bahai Blanca, also the Gulf of St. Matthias, and the mighty Gulf of St. George. Hoping that she might go clear of the destructive tide-races, the dread of big craft or little along this coast, I gave all the capes a berth of about fifty miles, for these dangers extend many miles from the land. But where the sloop avoided one danger, she encountered another, for one day, well off the Patagonian coast, while the sloop was reaching under short sail, a tremendous wave, the culmination it seemed of many waves, rolled down upon her in a storm, roaring as it came. I had only a moment to get all sail down, and myself up on the peak halyards out of danger, when I saw the mighty crest towering masthead high above me. The mountain of water submerged my vessel. She shook in every timber and reeled under the weight of the sea, but rose quickly out of it, and rode grandly over the rollers that followed. It may have been a minute that from my hold in the rigging I could see no part of the spray's hull. Perhaps it was even less time than that, but it seemed a long while, for under great excitement one lives fast, and in a few seconds one may think a great deal of one's past life. Not only did the past with electric speed flash before me, but I had time while in my hazardous position for resolutions for the future that would take a long time to fulfil. The first one was, I remember, that if the spray came through this danger, I would dedicate my best energies to building a larger ship on her lines, which I hope yet to do. 
other promises, less easily kept, I should have made under protest. However, the incident which filled me with fear was only one more test of the spray's worthiness. It reassured me against rude Cape Horn. From the time the great wave swept over the spray until she reaped Cape Virgins, nothing occurred to move a pulse and set blood in motion. On the contrary, the weather became fine and the sea smooth and life tranquil. The phenomenon of mirage frequently occurred. An albatross sitting on the water one day loomed up like a large ship. Two fur seals asleep on the surface of the sea appeared like great whales, and a bank of haze I could have sworn was high land. The kaleidoscope then changed, and on the following day I sailed in a world peopled by dwarfs. On February 11 the spray rounded Cape Virgins and entered the Strait of Magellan. The scene was again real and gloomy. The wind northeast and blowing a gale sent feather-white spume along the coast. Such a sea ran as would swamp an ill-appointed ship. As the sloop neared the entrance to the strait, I observed that two great tide races made ahead, one very close to the point of the land and one further offshore. Between the two, in a sort of channel, through comas, went the spray with close-reefed sails. But a rolling sea followed her a long way in, and a fierce current swept around the cape against her. But this she stemmed, and was soon chirruping under the lee of Cape Virgins, and running every minute into smoother water. However, long trailing kelp from sunken rocks waved forebodingly under her keel, and the wreck of a great steamship smashed on the beach abreast gave a gloomy aspect to the scene. I was not to be let off easy. The virgins would collect tribute even from the spray passing their promontory. Fitful rain squalls from the northwest followed the northeast gale. I reefed the sloop sails, and sitting in the cabin to rest my eyes, I was so strongly impressed with what in all nature I might expect that as I dozed the very air I breathed seemed to warn me of danger. My senses heard, Spray ahoy! shouted in warning. I sprang to the deck, wondering who could be there that knew the spray so well as to call out her name passing in the dark, for it was now the blackest of nights all around, except away in the southwest where rose the old familiar white arch, the terror of Cape Horn, rapidly pushed up by a southwest gale. I had only a moment to douse sail and lash all solid when it struck like a shot from a cannon, and for the first half-hour it was something to be remembered by way of a gale. For thirty hours it kept on blowing hard. The sloop could carry no more than a three-reefed mainsail and foresail, and with these she held on stoutly and was not blown out of the strait. In the height of the schools in this gale she doused all sail, and this occurred often enough. After this gale followed only a smart breeze, and the spray, passing through the narrows without mishap, cast anchor at Sandy Point on February 14, 1896. Sandy Point, Punta Arenas, is a Chilean coaling station, and boasts about 2,000 inhabitants, of mixed nationality, but mostly Chileans. What with sheep farming, gold mining, and hunting, the settlers in this dreary land seem not the worst off in the world. But the natives, Patagonian and Fuegian, on the other hand, were as squalid as contact with unscrupulous traders could make them. A large percentage of the business there was traffic in firewater. If there was a law against selling the poisonous stuff to the natives, it was not enforced. Fine specimens of the Patagonian race, looking smart in the morning when they came into town, had repented before night of ever having seen a white man, so beastly drunk were they, to say nothing about the peltry of which they had been robbed. The port at that time was free, but a custom-house was in course of construction, and when it is finished port and tariff dues are to be collected. A soldier police guarded the place, and a sort of vigilante force besides took down its guns now and then. But as a general thing to my mind, whenever an execution was made they killed the wrong man. 
Just previous to my arrival, the governor, himself of a jovial turn of mind, had sent a party of young bloods to foray a Fuegian settlement, and wipe out what they could of it, on account of the recent massacre of a schooner's crew somewhere else. Although the place was quite newsy, and supported two papers, dailies, I think, the port captain, a Chilean naval officer, advised me to ship hands to fight Indians in the strait further west, and spoke of my stopping until a gunboat should be going through, which would give me a tow. After canvassing the place, however, I found only one man willing to embark, and he on condition that I should ship another, moon and a dog. But as no one else was willing to come along, and as I drew the line at dogs, I said no more about the matter, but simply loaded my guns. At this point in my dilemma, Captain Pedro Samblick, a good Austrian of large experience coming along, gave me a bag of carpet tacks, worth more than all the fighting men and dogs of Tierra del Fuego. I protested that I had no use for carpet tacks on board. Samblick smiled at my want of experience, and maintained stoutly that I would have use for them. "'You must use them with discretion,' he said. "'That is to say, don't step on them yourself.' With this remote hint about the use of the tax, I got on all right, and saw the way to maintaining clear decks at night, without the care of watching. Samblick was greatly interested in my journey, and after giving me the tax he put on board bags of biscuits and a large quantity of smoked venison. He declared that my bread, which was ordinary sea biscuits and easily broken, was not nutritious as his, which was so hard that I could break it only with a stout blow from a maul. Then he gave me, from his own sloop, a compass which was certainly better than mine, and offered to unbend her mainsail for me if I would accept it. Last of all, this large-hearted man brought out a bottle of Fuegian gold dust from a place where it had been cached, and begged me to help myself from it, for use further along on the voyage. But I felt sure of success without this draught on a friend, and I was right. Samblick's tax, as it turned out, were of more value than gold. The port captain, finding that I was resolved to go on even alone, since there was no help for it, set up no further objection, but advised me, in case the savages tried to surround me with their canoes, to shoot straight, and begin to do it in time, but to avoid killing them if possible, which I heartily agreed to do. With these simple injunctions the officer gave me my port clearance free of charge, and I sailed on the same day, February 19, 1896. It was not without thoughts of strange and stirring adventure beyond all I had yet encountered, that I now sailed into the country and very core of the savage Fuegians. A fair wind from Sandy Point brought me on the first day to St. Nicholas Bay, where, so I was told, I might expect to meet savages. But seeing no signs of life, I came to anchor in eight fathoms of water, where I lay all night under a high mountain. Here I had my first experience with the terrific squalls, called Willy Wars, which extended from this point on, through the strait, to the Pacific. They were compressed gales of wind that Boreas handed down over the hills in chunks. A full-blown Willy War will throw a ship, even without sail on, over on her beam ends, but, like other gales, they cease now and then, if only for a short time. February 20 was my birthday, and I found myself alone with hardly so much as a bird in sight off Cape Froward, the southernmost point of the continent of America. By daylight in the morning I was getting my ship under way for the bout ahead. The sloop held the wind fair while she ran thirty miles further on her course, which brought her to Fortescue Bay, and at once among the native signal fires which blazed up now on all sides. Clouds flew over the mountain from the west all day. At night my good east wind failed, and in its stead a gale from the west soon came on. I gained anchorage at twelve o'clock that night, under the lee of a little island, and then prepared myself a cup of coffee, of which I was sorely in need. For, to tell the truth, 
hard beating in the heavy squalls and against the current had told on my strength. Finding that the anchor held, I drank my beverage and named the place Coffee Island. It lies to the south of Charles Island, with only a narrow channel between. By daylight the next morning the spray was again under way, beating hard, but she came into a cove in Charles Island two and a half miles along on her course. Here she remained undisturbed two days, with both anchors down in a bed of kelp. Indeed she might have remained undisturbed indefinitely, had not the wind moderated, for during these two days it blew so hard that no boat could venture out on the strait, and the natives being away to other hunting grounds, the island anchorage was safe. But at the end of the fierce windstorm, fair weather came. Then I got my anchors, and again sailed out upon the strait. Canoes, manned by savages from Fortescue, now came in pursuit. The wind falling light, they gained on me rapidly, till coming within hail when they ceased paddling, and a bow-legged savage stood up and called to me, Yama schooner, Yama schooner, which is their begging term. I said, No. Now I was not for letting on that I was alone, and so I stepped into the cabin, and passing through the hold came out at the forescuttle, changing my clothes as I went along. That made two men. Then the piece of bowsprit which I had sawed off at Buenos Aires, and which I had still on board, I arranged forward on the lookout, dressed as a seaman attaching a line by which I could pull it into motion. That made three of us, and we didn't want to yam a schooner. But for all that the savages came on faster than before. I saw that besides four at the paddles in the canoe nearest to me, there were others in the bottom, and that they were shifting hands often. At eighty yards I fired a shot across the bows of the nearest canoe, at which they all stopped, but only for a moment. Seeing that they persisted in coming nearer, I fired the second shot so close to the chap who wanted to yam a schooner that he changed his mind quickly enough, and bellowed with fear, Bueno ho, via Isla! And sitting down in his canoe, he rubbed his starboard cathead for some time. I was thinking of the good port captain's advice when I pulled the trigger, and must have aimed pretty straight. However, a miss was as good as a mile for Mr. Black Pedro, as he it was, and no other, a leader in several bloody massacres. He made for the island now, and the others followed him. I knew by his Spanish lingo and by his full beard that he was the villain I had named, a renegade mongrel and the worst murderer in Tierra del Fuego. The authorities had been in search of him for two years. The Fuegians are not bearded. So much for the first day among the savages. I came to anchor at midnight in Three Island Cove, about twenty miles along from Fortescue Bay. I saw on the opposite side of the strait signal fires, and heard the barking of dogs, but where I lay it was quite deserted by natives. I have always taken it as a sign that where I found birds sitting about, or seals on the rocks, I should not find savage Indians. Seals are never plentiful in these waters, but in Three Island Cove I saw one on the rocks, and other signs of the absence of savage men. On the next day the wind was again blowing a gale, and although she was in the lee of the land, the sloop dragged her anchors, so that I had to get her under way and beat further into the cove, where I came to in a landlocked pool. At another time or place this would have been a rash thing to do, and it was safe now, only from the fact that the gale which drove me to shelter would keep the Indians from crossing the strait. Seeing that this was the case, I went ashore with gun and axe on an island, where I could not in any event be surprised, and there felled trees and split about a cord of firewood, which loaded my boat several times. While I carried the wood, though I was morally sure there were no savages near, I never once went to or from the skiff without my gun. While I had that and a clear field of over eighty yards about me, I felt safe. The trees on the island, very scattering, were a sort of beech and a stunted cedar, both of which made good fuel. Even the green limbs of the beech, which seemed to possess a resinous quality, burned readily in my great drum-stove. I have described my method of wooding up in detail, 
that the reader who has kindly borne with me so far may see that in this, as in all other particulars of my voyage, I took great care against all kinds of surprises, whether by animals or by the elements. In the Strait of Magellan the greatest vigilance was necessary. In this instance I reasoned that I had all about me the greatest danger of the whole voyage, the treachery of cunning savages, for which I must be particularly on the alert. The spray sailed from Three Island Cove in the morning after the gale went down, but was glad to return for shelter from another sudden gale. Sailing again on the following day, she fetched Borgia Bay, a few miles on her course, where vessels had anchored from time to time, and had nailed boards on the trees ashore, with name and date of harbouring carved or painted. Nothing else could I see to indicate the civilised man had ever been before. I had taken a survey of the gloomy place with my spy-glass, and was getting my boat out to land and take notes, when the Chilean gunboat Humel came in, and officers coming on board advised me to leave the place at once, a thing that required little eloquence to persuade me to do. I accepted the captain's kind offer of a tow to the next anchorage, at the place called Notch Cove, eight miles further along where I should be clear of the worst of the Fuegians. We made anchorage at the cove about dark that night, while the wind came down in fierce willy wars from the mountains. An instance of Magellan weather was afforded when the Humel, a well-appointed gunboat of great power, after attempting on the following day to proceed on her voyage, was obliged by sheer force of the wind to return and take up anchorage again, and remain till the gale abated and lucky she was to get back. Meeting this vessel was a little godsend. She was commanded and officered by high-class sailors and educated gentlemen. An entertainment that was gotten up on her, impromptu, at the notch, would be hard to beat anywhere. One of her midshipmen sang popular songs in French, German, and Spanish, and one, so he said, in Russian. If the audience did not know the lingo of one song from another, it was no drawback to the merriment. I was left alone the next day, for then the Humel put out on her voyage, the gale having abated. I spent a day taking in wood and water. By the end of that time the weather was fine. Then I sailed from the desolate place. There is little more to be said concerning the spray's first passage through the strait that would differ from what I have already recorded. She anchored and weighed many times, and beat many days against the current, with now and then a slant for a few miles, till finally she gained anchorage and shelter for the night at Port Tamar, with Cape Pillar in sight to the west. Here I felt the throb of the great ocean that lay before me. I knew now that I had put a world behind me, and that I was opening out another world ahead. I had passed the haunts of savages. Great piles of granite mountains of bleak and lifeless aspect were now astern. On some of them not even a speck of moss had ever grown. There was an unfinished newness all about the land. On the hill back of Port Tamar a small beacon had been thrown up showing that some man had been there, but how could one tell but that he had died of loneliness and grief? In a bleak land is not the place to enjoy solitude. Throughout the whole of the strait west of Cape Froward I saw no animals except dogs, owned by savages. These I saw often enough, and heard them yelping night and day. Birds were not plentiful. The scream of a wild fowl, which I took for a loon, sometimes startled me with its piercing cry. The steamboat duck, so called because it propels itself over the sea with its wings, and resembles a miniature side-wheel steamer in its motion, was sometimes seen scurrying on out of danger. It never flies, but hitting the water instead of the air with its wings, it moves faster than a rowboat or a canoe. The few fur seals I saw were very shy, and of fishes I saw next to none at all. I did not catch one. Indeed, I seldom or never put a hook over during the whole voyage. Here in the strait I found great abundance of mussels of an excellent quality. I fared sumptuously on them. There was a sort of swan, smaller than a muscovy duck, which might have been brought down with the gun. 
but in the loneliness of life about the dreary country, I found myself in no mood to make one life less, except in self-defence. End of chapter 7 Recording by Alan Chant in Tunbridge, Kent, England www.sevenoaksprep.kent.sch.uk